All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our third RSM speaker series event of the semester. Um, we're really lucky to have Rob Gorwa and Michael Veal joining us via Zoom, and I'll just quickly introduce our guests. Uh, Rob is a postdoctoral research fellow at the WZB Berlin Social Science Center, a fellow at the Center for Democracy and Technology and the Center for International Governance Innovation, as well as a co-founder of the Platform Governance Research Network. Uh, and his first book, The Politics of Platform Regulation, is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Uh, and Michael is Associate Professor in Digital Rights and Regulation and Vice Dean for Educational Innovation at University College London's Faculty of Laws. His research focuses on how to understand and address challenges of power and justice that digital technologies and the users create and exacerbate in areas such as privacy-enhancing technologies and machine learning. Um, and they're here today to discuss their work on the emerging governance challenges posed by AI model marketplaces uh, and other intermediaries in the AI ecosystem. Um, we'll be sure to leave some time for questions, so please put them into the chat and the Q&A function. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Rob and Michael. Welcome. Well, hi, everyone. I think I'll, I'll get started. Uh, uh, it's really great to be here. Um, we'll, we'll dig right in um, to this paper, which is uh, forthcoming. It's available online, but we'll be running through some of the main points together. Um, so what we're talking about today is about intermediaries in AI. We often hear of AI talked about like a black box or an algorithm or something like this. But in practice, it's a lot more like traditional internet regulation and challenges within it, because just like the internet, it is made up of uh, often tens, hundreds of intermediaries that work together to deliver the services functionality that you see. Uh, so you could say that AI is more about intermediaries than artificial intelligence in a way. And we can feel that there, uh, we can just see some of them familiar faces and they'll recur again and again. The training data centers, AWS, NVIDIA providing the chips or Azure, uh, teaming up with a lot of the nascent AI companies. You find that uh, important data sources and those who maintain and manage them are key as well. Uh, lie on common crawl for um, images and text. Um, and Microsoft also runs something called Coco, common objects and context, just a fraction of some of these uh, training data sets that we see. Uh, of course, famous foundation model developers building uh, large models using large amounts of compute that others build upon and doing so using other intermediaries that themselves are also uh, le digital labor platforms like SAMA or Mechanical Turk, labeling this data, cleaning, refining it. Further providers such as Vertex AI from Google or Amazon SageMaker offer people the ability to tweak and fine tune some of those foundation models using their own data, which may in turn come from those labeling services uh, and use the compute services above so you can start to see that intertwined. You also find that the devices that query the models themselves um, are involved in consumer devices, for example, uh, Apple and Google being key actors here, um, and the operators that host these models like Hugging Face uh, and GitHub, which we'll be talking about today with their open source, they'll be placed on these hosting intermediaries. Uh, services like ChatGPT uh, and so on provide users as feedback providers and act as services to intermediate between these whole technology stacks. And you have firms that integrate all of this together to sell it as a bundled product and to resell it uh, and to make all these links together for people. So all of these just indicate a world of intermediaries that activate not always in the same way, not always in the same configuration, um, and not always with knowledge of each other in a single process. So when we talk about regulating or governing AI, we have a lot of intervention points here, just like we do uh, on other kinds of network technologies. Um, and that is the focus of uh, this research agenda that Rob and I are, are working on along with many other people um, to feel about this area to work out where interventions look like. So I'll pass to Rob to talk about the focus for today. Yeah, so the paper that we want to talk about um, is about something that we call model marketplaces, which is our alliterative little term uh, for AI hosting intermediaries. Again, these are interesting platforms that have emerged in the AI intermediary and development ecosystem in the last couple of years. Um, and they've started to attract more journalistic attention, but not actually that much from academics so far. So anyway, we just started getting interested in these different platforms, which at their core are online services that allow users to upload or create custom models. 
Um, and what I think differentiates a model marketplace from all of the other services that are bundling, um, you know, access to AI models or building business models around, I guess, the ability to query and interact with AI models is that this basically uh, is serving as like a kind of new type of user generated content platform. Uh, where people can upload different models or more commonly tuned version of models and then interact with them in various ways, such as downloading them or maybe querying them um, via a structured web interface. So these are often characterized as part of the open source AI ecosystem. Um, there's a bunch of different services and business models involved here that we'll overview in a little bit. And in the paper, we really dive in on kind of two broad categories of these model marketplaces. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will have heard of Hugging Face, a French startup, a French slash American based in New York startup that brands itself as a kind of GitHub for machine learning. These are general purpose online platforms that allow people to upload models um, as well as data sets. Um, and weights and other kind of things that might be useful for people doing machine learning work, uh, either as individuals or organizations. And these models are across a whole wide range of topics from translation to image classification and feature extraction. And there are also some kind of quote unquote generative models like uh, major open large language models that are available via these platforms. The second broad category that we focus on in the paper are generative model marketplaces, um, especially in the image generation context. So we'll also talk about some platforms that are emerging uh, specifically kind of in the amateur art community, which specialize often in one broad category of model. So you're not going to find translation models here. It's going to be image generation models uh, and sometimes even, you know, specialize in specific um, sub models or specific kind of uh, the image generation models like stable diffusion um, by Stability AI. So I'm sure uh, many of you, and I wish I could, you know, we can't see your faces today because it's online. And if, if we were in a room together, I'd maybe ask for a show of hands to ask how many of you have um, been on Hugging Face or aware of Hugging Face, have interacted with it. But this is basically the front page um, of the website. And just to point out a few things here, this is, um, it's really interesting because A, you can see the, the sheer kind of popularity of these platforms as they've emerged, especially Hugging Face in particular. So I don't know exactly when you took the screenshot, Michael, but uh, yeah, today. As, of, as of today, there is more than 500,000 different models available here. And you can easily search them with all of these kind of tags that are on the left uh, hand of the screen. And one thing that's really important to notice is that a mix of basically big research labs and organizations, so, you know, for example, Google Brain, Google Research, uh, Facebook AI Research slash Meta, uh, Stability AI, all of these kind of major, major research organizations are uploading their models, uh, making them widely available here. Um, you know, some of these are very popular. Uh, you can't see it here, but one of the major stability AI, AI models has four or five million downloads or queries uh, in the last couple months, as well as a kind of mix of, um, I guess, you know, hobbyists. Um, so right at the bottom left column, you can see a model called Moon Dream, which was just published by uh, an individual. Um, and this is, what was it? It was, uh, it was a it was LLM it designed... Exactly. So again, you can see that there are some content discovery mechanisms that are being integrated here. They have a trending models function. That one was just uploaded a day ago and has 3,000 downloads. So anyway, this is Hugging Face. So very briefly in the paper, I guess what we were trying to do was uh, explore this kind of weird space that is emerging and just do a little bit of a preliminary mapping of the different platforms and companies that are existing in this space. And as we'll get into, kind of uh, how they are dealing with content governance problems. Uh, and we'll get into this as to why this is the interest of our paper um, and why we think it poses some particularly interesting challenges for internet regulation. So anyway, without going too far into depth of this, um, it's all available in the paper online. But you can see that there's a bunch of different services that we found. Um, they have kind of different valences. There's a lot of image generation ones. 
There's some generic ones, even though hug and face is the most popular. And I guess um, just to reiterate the kind of first point I made, the key thing that we consider to be, I guess, the necessary condition of a model marketplace is that it allows third party user upload of models. So there are many other services that provide intermediation functions that, for example, allow you to interact with maybe stable diffusion uh, via an iPhone app. Um, there are other services for image generation like Midjourney, for example, which are really popular, uh, but you cannot upload models to Midjourney or kind of directly um, uh, tamper or, or, or play with the models. Um, you have to interact with them with a structured interface. Uh, I think in the case of Midjourney, it's uh, largely by Discord. Um, so this is a kind of uh, breakdown of the different models in the space. Uh, and we looked at whether they had content policies and um, how they developed those policies, but we'll get into that. Okay, so kind of bringing us to the meat of this paper was the realization that model marketplaces, um, which we think are interesting and increasingly important intermediaries in the kind of AI supply chain and the AI stack are increasingly facing moderation issues. So one public scandal, which uh, didn't get a huge amount of attention, but caught some traction in the machine learning community happened in 2021, 2022, uh, where a Swiss machine learning researcher, who's also a YouTuber, took two um, popular, well, he, he took a popular open source large language model and then tuned it using a data set um, that a group of researchers had collected, which was basically um, a collection of all of the posts that were posted on the 4chan politically incorrect forum um, in the last few years. And using this, um, the YouTuber slash researcher kind of said it was a bit of a prank. Uh, he created a model that he called GPT 4chan, uh, in effect, a kind of large language model for hate speech and harassment that he said he released uh, for research purposes, putting the code on GitHub and then the model up on Hugging Face. So this kicked um, the Hugging Face staff directly into gear and Michael is gonna briefly talk about how and what they did. Yeah, so here you see, um, this is like the community discussion page. This is where some of the content moderation action now happens on a hugging face. I'm not really having an exact venue for it. Uh, initially, when it was set up, it didn't really have a clear content moderation policy in its early days. Um, and here you see um, some people concerned about it. You see that someone says they tried out the demo model of a tool four times using some benign text. Uh, the first response was just the N-word, and the second uh, the, the second was a sentence about climate change, which led to a conspiracy theory about the Rothschilds and Jews being behind it. And you kind of get an idea of what this model is doing. So um, Wade's in the content moderation staff of Hugging Face, and the content moderation staff is actually the CEO. So we go quite straight to the top when we do content moderation uh, in this very hands-on platform. And this is only a couple of years ago, but less than that now, um, even. Um, where Clement Delang asks, uh, comes in and says, okay, we had an internal debate around this, you know, um, clearly not having consolidated a policy uh, previously, and we think it should stay up, although we think it should be clearer about its limitations. But that only lasted for a few days, because within about a week, um, Hugging Face staff changed their mind and said, we will, after all, disable this model. So what's happening here? Well, well one thing that's happening is just a discussion about the sheer difficulty of moderating these kinds of uh, models here. And one of the reasons it's so difficult um, is because we have three different ways in which we might think that models as tools um, can be understood as being harmful or risky or so on. We have their intended uses. Uh, we have the idea that uh, you could say, this is a model designed to troll people on, on 4chan, um, and therefore you could have a policy about that. You could put it in a model card, um, which is a, a metadata for models that's been popularized following the model cards for model reporting paper. Um, that's pretty easy to moderate, right? Because it's just comparing intention against a list of policies, um, pretty simple. But you have two areas which are then harder to deal with at this point. You have the realized uses. Empirically, has a model been used in a certain way? And you have the potential uses. Does a model have affordances or does it have the, the, the actual capabilities to be used to do this? The first requires empirical evidence and the second requires analytic evidence, neither of which are cheap or indeed self-evident. 
We can see that the hardest one maybe from this is the potential, um, because suddenly you have to uh, look into a model and really red team it or put it in uh, you know, a lot of uh, different um, situations and imagine how it can be used using a variety of say technology assessment methodologies, um, as well as some uh, actual formal analysis of what's, what, it capable, what its capabilities are. But legislation in many jurisdictions already forces platforms to moderate models for their potential use. So our context here to start with is that we're looking at jurisdictions um, that are not the United States, because the United States is a global outlier in the way that Section 230 does not require takedown under any circumstances. That's not quite true. There are specific circumstances, but uh, we're not going to get into the amendments of that. Um, Almost every other jurisdiction in the world operates uh, for most of their illegality, a bit like the DMCA does, with a notice and takedown process. Um, so that's the norm, and it means that when I submit a complaint of illegality, a, a corporation can lose at least that level of shielding uh, if they don't take down uh, the, 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 the content, and the complaint was well-founded, the notification was clearly pointing to illegal content on that platform. There may be other layers of shielding below, like you don't automatically become liable. The laws themselves uh, determine that uh, the law that renders the whole thing illegal in the first place. So that's the context. So let's look at some of these potential legislation. Well, looking at the UK, uh, models that produce information that are useful to a person preparing a terrorist act are likely already illegal, like the anarchist cookbook. If the model regurgitates this, um, this is likely to be full foul of the Terrorism Act 2000. It can be transformed into, say, bomb instructions or so on. And that's about potential information there. Models that have the potential to be converted into indecent images of children are considered indecent images of children, whether they're virtual or not. Uh, and that's effectively a, a, they're called a pseudo photograph in the law. Um, and some of the logic is you, know, you can't pass for a protector zip file and say, well, I put the other bit of information, you need to unlock it over here. Therefore, the zip file itself is not illegal or contains, does not trigger any liability. Similarly, a model itself that is just one prompt away, uh, whether it's carefully crafted or not, from producing indecent images of children uh, would fall foul of this uh, regime. Models that leak private data, we know that that happens. We know that models memorize credit card numbers, national security numbers, social security numbers, other bits of information. Uh, and it's not just private information, actually. It can be biographical information that is considered personal data. Well, they can attract liability. It doesn't necessarily mean they're illegal, but it's something that can be considered from their potential. It's just like a data set that can be potentially uh, released. And more controversially, copyrighted content, and we're not going to go into that, but of course, there are ongoing court cases about this that you, can, you many people in the audience will know about. So just to give a flavor, these things point to potential. So it already drags platforms into having to respond to the hardest of these three categories, or arguably the hardest. So they don't have a choice just to look at the intended use. Uh, they are often going to be dragged into making decisions about the potential use. And this is compounded by the fact that some of the model marketplaces we looked at, like Civitai, which uh, since we wrote this paper uh, has, has actually become fairly well known in this area. Um, we put the paper out last November or so, uh, initially or last October. Um, uh, we, we found that you know, Civitai is, is itself, well, it's, it's, it's working on the basis of illegality uh, pretty much. Oops, it was going forward and back here. Um, uh, we work, it's working on the basis of, of uh, consent, not, uh, consensual and non-consensual uh, AI uh, porn in many cases, and therefore it's not surprising that we get um, liability that accrues from that. Um, and we find that in that liability, there's pressure. The pressure of um, other infrastructural providers, other supply chain actors that place content moderation pressures on other parts of this algorithmic supply chain. This is not uncommon. We've seen this, say, payment providers, obviously pressuring content moderation uh, on, say, Tumblr or OnlyFans relating to uh, MasterCard or PayPal, uh, providing pressure. It's classic internet regulation here. Um, OctoML, which was used by Civitai to power some of its image generation that was happening on the platform, itself was very concerned around child sexual abuse imagery being used and demanded certain moderation, undertook certain scanning itself, and eventually cut off its relationship with Civitai. So we see those all things as causing pressure for, con for these platforms to moderate, both in uh, jurisdictions around the world, but in this case, also in the US, despite Section 230. 
So yeah, so we there was actually a really, yeah. oh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, there was just a interesting question in the chat or a comment noting at the, the kind of prevalence of different social features that are being integrated. Um, and just in the interest of time, we had a few more slides that were walking through the interface of Civitai and some of these other platforms, uh, which we cut, unfortunately. But they do have some really interesting affordances um, relating to the kind of generation of some of these problematic forms of material um, that we're going to get into. And that's things like the ability to combine different models on the platform, um, the ability to uh, yeah, easily deploy models on the platform, um, to interact with them. And there is like more fundamental business model questions around how they are making money and who their user base is. But we'll get all, into all of that uh, in a second. So first, um, this question of how our model marketplace is actually responding to this. So the first half of the paper, I guess, sets out this context and deals with some of the policy, um, the challenges, and also, I guess, the existing kind of background and context under extant law, as Michael mentioned. And then we moved to a, say, a, a set of policy case studies um, of three major uh, model marketplaces as part of writing, or I could say maybe two model marketplaces um, and one kind of legacy software repository, software hosting intermediary that has uh, model marketplace-esque valences. So how are these companies responding? One of the first major things we're seeing is, I guess, also through a fairly classic um, dynamic of content governance and content moderation in, um, in, in ways that, I guess, is inspired by some of the tradition in social media and user-generated content regulation. Um, so filtering uh, and also trying to limit model visibility and ad friction in various ways. So we're seeing that some platforms um, under pressure from governance stakeholders, Michael will get into this, um, it's not just journalists and the public, but also increasingly some government actors that are requesting uh, the takedown of certain models. Um, but because the business model of a lot of these marketplaces is predicated on removing friction, on making the ability to deploy models easier for lay users uh, and for organizations, um, you know, Things like Hugging Faces inference endpoints, um, which can be queried and, and used to play with all sorts of different kinds of models in, in the development pipeline, um, as well as, I guess, various online features that just make the discoverability of different models easier. Um, there's some simple interventions that companies can take and are taking to um, add some of that friction back. So for example, uh, if you go on Hugging Face and you look at the main model repository pages, most of them have a little widget where you can directly interact with um, a toy version of the model. Um, and that is something that the Hugging Face team in the case of uh, GPT-4chan, for example, initially limited uh, as part of their kind of moderation interventions into that. Um, they can make it harder for users to download, for example, putting it behind a login wall so it's not just fully public, um, and they could remove it from you know, major discovery mechanisms like the trending section and the front page. Um, and something we're seeing increasingly with uh, new kind of hyped model releases is that some of these um, some of these models are requiring users to actually identify themselves and sign some kind of uh, contract. Uh, or license before being able to download. Another thing we're saying is something that we call in the paper uh, bolting on mitigation features or basically uh, different types of automated filtering um, for, I guess, safety, for trust and safety. And there are two broad categories of this. Um, we're seeing some developers actually try to bundle these into their models. And again, this is a, a potentially important intervention, but it's hard to make the stick especially for more savvy users who can, um, who can remove it locally. And uh, a focus of our paper, I guess, is on marketplace filters. Um, so the model marketplaces themselves are starting to apply both input and output filters. Uh, so for example, doing uh, keywords, uh, searches that block, for example, certain types of queries. Uh, again, users are working around this, so it's a bit of an arms race, uh, as well as kind of output filters. So. Uh, what Civitai was doing, for instance, was taking a off-the-shelf computer vision offering like Amazon Recognition, trying to get it to uh, detect nudity, and then running um, 
all kind of outputs that are being queried directly or being being um, created directly via the Civitai platform and their partners like OctoMML, those are getting scanned um, and potentially flagged as not safe for work or even removed. So what's the second thing that we're seeing in this space as well? Yeah, so uh, we're looking, one one thing that was, uh, we're moving now to some points, I think, that are a bit kind of novel and curious that we were discovering and wanted to analyze as part of this, this paper. One is the outsourcing of moderation standards um, themselves. Uh, and that's an unusual thing. We don't really see this very often. What's happening here when we look at Hugging Face is that Hugging Face is spending quite a lot of effort and energy, including in academic spaces, um, pushing something they call behavioral use licenses. These are like the evolution of copyleft licenses, where the uh, distribution and use of uh, IP protected material is conditional on the behavior of the licensee. So uh, the main one is open rail, that's open responsible AI license. Um, but there are many, many others that are being used, including specific ones being generated by developers themselves. It's not entirely new. JSON, the JavaScript object notation language, actually has a don't don't be evil license. Uh, don't 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 use for evil, only use for good. So you can't use JSON for evil, but I think that's probably not very enforceable. Um, and there's the uh, the they're not really famous, I'd say, but it's one of the things attempting to say is famous. Uh, the uh, anyone but Richard Stallman license, which is uh, was uh, sort of maybe one of these joke licenses that exist that say anyone can use this for anything unless you are Richard Stallman, in which case you cannot use it for anything at all. So there are, there are a world of specific licenses that have existed before. Um, oops, I don't know what's happening here? Um, there you go. Um, there, um, however, however, um, the uh, what's happened here is that um, Hugging Face doesn't just uh, respond to the actual licensor or their agent saying, "Hey, we see something on our, on your platform that is, say, a version of our model." That has been used in a terms for say me medical use or to um to create harm to people or in a discriminatory way or to be used by police or something like this uh, that someone's posted on your platform please take it down they actually respond to third parties pointing out these license uh, these license terms have been breached so they someone says hey you know, this model actually breaches the terms of the upstream model that were written in a very open-ended way and so hugging face ends up enforcing by the looks of what they're doing right now and this may change in the future um, and looking to a world where they're enforcing uh, rules that are written by other people. Um, this is a problem because you should be very careful with the rules you write into your content moderation uh, uh, guidelines, community standards and similar, because some things are very difficult to operationalize. Um, and we'll see some of these here. So if we look at the open rail license, which is the most popular of the behavioral use licenses on the platform. Uh, will we see that uh, you, you can not use models to disseminate verifiably false information. You can't disseminate personal information that can be used to harm an individual or to generate it at all. Um, you can't disparage somebody using a model. We're not sure what that would mean in this case. Uh, you can't violate any applicable national, federal, state, local, or even international law uh, using this model, uh, which will depend on your jurisdiction. It's very unclear how that would work. Um, and you can't have uh, the indirect discrimination or disparate impact using a model, which is also difficult to prove. We're not saying any of these things are bad terms in principle, but they're very hard to operationalize in practice. They're very hard to operationalize in the classic content moderation landscape um, of uh, outsourced or fast decisions that are being made, uh, ideally not by the CEO every single time. And we saw this as an example that we draw upon in the paper. Um, and thanks to 404 Media for the picture, when they covered our paper, they made some beautiful images. So we are going to just borrow these now with much thanks to the reporting. Please go and subscribe to that fantastic journalistic uh, endeavor. Um, in 2022 and 2023, Hugging Face removed models of Xi Jinping singing. And they removed it because a complaint was made. It was redacted. We don't know who made this complaint, but it was very similar to complaints made on GitHub by the Chinese Network Authority, which is a part of the Chinese government that uh, does take these kind of requests on the base of Chinese law and take down requests. And they said, please remove this model because uh, and Hugging Face did remove it. We didn't, I can't see the exact request, but Hugging Face removed it saying, we remove it because it is not in adherence with the upstream model's license. The upstream model, which creates singing voices or whoever you want to upload and fine tune the model to do, um, 
was hosted on GitHub and someone had placed, the, or the, the licensor had placed a license saying no political use allowed for this uh, model. And so immediately you weighed into saying this is political and that is the reason why you couldn't do it. Now, Hugging Face did afterwards when pressed by 404 say it's also impersonation and that's not part of our community standards, at which point uh, 404 asked why they hadn't take down, was taken down all these Biden singing generators um, that were on Hugging Face and uh, apparently there was no response forthcoming at that point. So you can see this is a very thorny area and we're not pointing the finger at Hugging Face for doing anything bad or unethical. In fact, we, we quite like them as an organization. Um, the point is they, they can't put their hand up and say, we will solve all these problems or we will be the intervention point or the arbiter for all of these issues or indeed the arbiter of other people's rules. It is not a job you want. It is not a job you should be volunteering for. And we need to have some careful consideration about how this whole ecosystem is going to work in terms of moderation for it not to go a bit wrong. One lesson that we did see that is a very interesting trajectory and something that we think could hold promise for the future, although it's not perfect, was on GitHub. Now, GitHub isn't strictly a model marketplace, at least not primarily, it's a software uh, repository. And one thing that Rob and I found when writing this paper is it is astounding that nobody in scholarship, as we are aware of, has written about GitHub's content moderation policies. We tried to look, if you know anything, please do send us a postcard. Um, uh, there was no literature we could find that was really doing analysis of software moderation on GitHub. Surprising, there's been lots of research on all kinds of platforms, but um, so we had to do quite a lot of primary work digging through uh, threads and, um, and, and blogs and posts and forums and all these kind of things and Reddit threads and all these kind of things to find out. Some interesting juicy tales for you folk. And here's a juicy tale that we discovered, which was that uh, in 2020, and some of you may know this, it was reported lightly at the time, uh, GitHub removed YouTube DL, which was a tool, probably many people have used it in the chat, I'd imagine. Um, it's a command line tool where you can put in a YouTube uh, URL and it will give you a copy of the video, very handy. The beloved Recording Industry of America uh, sent a takedown request under DMCA section 1201, which is the anti-circumvention um, section. And that relates to software that can go around digital rights management. Um, long being pointed as problematic as a, as a clause by people like Pamela Samuelson uh, for many, many years. Um, uh, but it's a difficult one to deal with. And so GitHub did take it down. Then there was public outcry. GitHub then commissioned legal analysis. And they looked at this and they actually in the end said, look, it's not really removing protections the rights holders are put on. It's just getting the HTML video out. It's not kind of cracking some specific rights holder protected uh, file, so we don't believe it falls under the anti-circumvention rules, and GitHub reinstated it. In the process, GitHub, in our view, or from our reading of this, clearly realized that this is unsustainable. They cannot go and commission legal analysis in a detailed way and reason in this slow, expensive way about every anti-circumvention tool takedown request. And so what they did was very interesting. They put up a $1 million fund, and they said, you can use this fund, you can apply to it. If we take down your anti-circumvention, potential anti-circumvention uh, 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 tool or your potential circumvention tool rather, um, which we'll do fairly liberally now, like we will take them down if we get requests, as long as they look plausible, you can apply to us for money. You can use that money and you can hire some lawyers or an analyst or whatever, whatever you need to write a DMCA counter notice which uh, the geeks in the audience will be will be loving because DMCA counter notices are a, um, a very interesting tool. They're, they're not exactly great at solving all the problems of the world. Um, they require the um, person whose content has been removed to submit uh, under threat of perjury a good, uh, a good faith uh, statement that they believed it to be actually legal to have that content on the platform. Uh, and that effectively triggers the reinstatement of the content on the platform, and it moves the dispute to between the rights holder and the uploader. So the content can go up and the dispute is then moved elsewhere, and then the conclusion of that plays out. Um, we don't know how much has been taken up, but we do know that it's been offered many, many times because we have that data from GitHub. And what's happening here is an externalization of analytic capacity. So while Hugging Face was doing a lot of... Um, uh, analysis in-house, it seems, and maybe moving to a world where they're going to have to do more and more of this, and it's going to get very burdensome to think about that potential. GitHub says, 
and their previous non-machine learning model, but software, dual use software related um, story. So it's actually, we need to put this outside, put a limit on the money we'll pay. We need to make other people do that work and give us better information or get it moved, get these disputes moved elsewhere. Um, so this could be a way forwards or at least a flavor of a way forwards um, because we don't believe that these model uh, marketplaces will be capable of being everything to everyone and having all this capacity themselves, even though they will have to play an important role nonetheless. So what's next? Um, we've already been talking for more than 30 minutes, so we'll start wrapping up. And yeah, please do check out the paper if you're interested in any of this. Um, it's, I don't know about you, Michael, it's my longest paper. I think it clocked in at like 18 or 19,000 words. Um, as Michael said, we were, you know, really diving into some of the earlier software studies work on GitHub. We were trying to find work on content governance um, in the GitHub context, having a hard time, and just also trying to do a lot of, you know, background mapping, analysis of different business models emerging, as well as a policy analysis and some case studies. So yeah, we were, we were having a hard time finding a venue that would take such a monster <laughs> paper. Maybe we should have split it and done like a part one, part two, but anyway. Or go for a US law journal with like a million pages and one in two inch margins. Oh man, with the, with the US law journal <laughs> footnotes, this would have been... <laughs> would have been off the chain. Um, but I just want to kind of wrap up um, with, with a short note on some of the layers of challenges that we think are interesting here. And my background is as a, as a platform governance, as a content moderation policy researcher. Um, so I really came at this from the, from the angle of trying to, I guess, think about the stuff I know and I guess, think about what is new and different and interesting here in terms of different affordances and dynamics and um, yeah, different kind of policy features. So I think we're seeing at least a different types, uh, a few different types of problems emerge through these case studies that we've done, which again are available in the paper. Um, and some of these are not new challenges for internet regulation, right? Uh, so something like a bad actor problem where already, and we didn't give it um, you know, that much time here, but some of the model marketplaces that are being really popular uh, are doing stuff um, and maybe are aware of their liabilities uh, under extant law or maybe not. Uh, we were digging through the Civitai Reddit forums and there was a beautiful post um, where actually users told them that they need to have EMCA uh, copyright takedown forms. And they said, oh yeah, good idea. I never heard of it. None of us are lawyers. Um, but as they've been kind of taking this stuff more seriously, um, there's a question to what extent um, they actually can or wish to deal with this problem. They've had a super adversarial relationship with uh, creators in the copyright space, especially. Um, there's this incredible open letter that they published themselves on their Reddit where a artist complained that many users were making models designed to specifically impersonate his art. And they sent him an email which basically said, hey, guess what? Have you heard of the Streisand effect, you idiot? We've created a contest where now, you know, dozens of people are trying to make the best Sam Does Arts impersonation model. Um, so, you know, uh, how do you feel about that now? And it kind of reminds me, I mean, that's like an extreme example. Screenshot on the paper think, of this, by the way. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't think they're, um, you know, as, I guess, laissez-faire, um, or as, yeah, just just completely um, candid about these things with areas like child sexual abuse imagery, uh, pseudo child sexual abuse imagery, which is a huge issue for them, as well as non-consensual uh, intimate image abuse imagery, which is uh, also, I guess, uh, uh, you know, something that they do have policies against. Um, but two just quick things here. It reminds me of that old saying where it's very hard to make someone understand something when their livelihood depends on them not understanding it. Um, the case certainly isn't helped when certain platforms in the space are being funded by VCs that consider trust and safety and content moderation to be an enemy of progress, um, just a mere kind of speed bump to be blasted over in the race for AI supremacy of whatever sort they're envisioning. Um, so again, this is just an issue. If companies are really hesitant, even if they're headquartered in a jurisdiction where they're accessible, like Civitai, which I believe is in Boise, um, you know, there's always a question of, of actual compliance uh, and foot dragging. 
And even there, that isn't the worst that we've seen. I think um, you know there's a there's a comment in the chat about some of the the new services that are emerging, which again are have some freaky affordances. Already we've seen a, a service called Shogoth emerge online, which is branding itself as a regulation proof peer-to-peer -peer model marketplace that's based on the BitTorrent protocol. So again, what does that mean for the ability of regulators with differential levels of regulatory capacity to be able to competently uh, and confidently intervene in this area? I think that's a problem. Relatedly, there's a capacity problem. Um, here, we're just focusing on the model marketplaces, not just on regulators, but particularly for these companies, as Michael, I think, showed really well, once you're under fire from uh, government stakeholders and stakes are high, or you're increasingly getting public, uh, public pushback or pushback from NGOs, uh, child safety groups, there's a lot of pressure to do something, um, but in this particular case, we think that moderation is really difficult, uh, and it's just inherently expensive and difficult, um, hard to outsource. Uh, I don't think that long term, just simply bolting on some output filters is a sustainable um, is a sustainable, I guess, policy response here. And again, we don't really have evidence on the actual efficacy of these types of filters on pseudo content. But again. That's developing. So moderation, um, there's a lot of pressure to do it. And I will add like the stakes are high. So obviously in the traditional user generated content, um, context, content moderators, platforms, you know, have to deal with incredibly um, difficult, traumatic, uh, polarizing, I mean, you know, pick your adjective of choice, um, content that really can potentially uh, have, have harmful impacts on people. But here, I think the scale is just way harder because, again, these are tools that can be used in very, very uh, powerful and even potentially kind of unforeseen generative ways downstream by people. Uh, and once the cat is out of the bag, um, in the time that a platform hasn't responded yet, and again, remember that a big platform like Hugging Face is getting hundreds of models uploaded daily by lay users. They have 500 plus thousand models. Um, again, we have a real capacity problem. And then I guess there's just an inherent structural problem, and I've already alluded to this. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but basically, I guess about the, the way that models can be mixed and tweaked off platforms. Platforms are a regulatory leverage point, uh, both informal and formal through actual liability. Uh, but again, like I said, um, it's relatively easy for, lay, uh, for, for sophisticated users to take these uh, to try to bypass these different filtering mechanisms, uh, take models off platform, run locally, et cetera. And uh, yeah, the safeguards that different actors are trying to embed into their platforms and even into the models themselves might not be that sticky. Um, and, and yeah, uh, to what extent is it possible, I guess, for, for uh, platforms to be really actively um, and comprehensively um, auditing these different models at scale uh, without, I guess, doing some major changes to their business model, like starting to do manual review of different models in the way that an app store um, does um, for developers. So again, uh, interesting valences um, on this interesting platform. So what do we do about it? I guess there are three broad, you know, these are just some of the problems that we pin out in this paper. Um, and I know that Michael has some ideas um, of how we might kind of reply to this capacity problem uh, in the very least. Yeah, so the last thing we'll just say, I think just to wrap up here, you know, so sort of we leave the work going forwards for some things we're working on right now as well. Um, uh, maybe it's a legal geek problem, but uh, when you submit a takedown request, to a platform alleging that this plat this violates either a law or a standard or a license or something like this, the platform has to adjudicate on this. We know this, platform governance is the way it works. However, um, legally, thinking of jurisdictions that are not Section 230 style jurisdictions, and maybe ones that are more DMCA style, but including the DMCA as well, given all the behavioral use licensing, intermediary liability shielding is lost if a in EU and UK at least, if um, if a firm is given specific actual knowledge or made aware of infringing content, such that a diligent economic operator should be able to know that legality. The point of having this as a fairly high standard rather than just someone saying, hey, you know eBay, it's full of counterfeits. Aren't you aware? Like your eBay, you should know. 
but saying no, no, this was a counterfeit bag specifically. Here's the evidence. Here, you know, uh, here's the legal. We have the rights for that. Please take it down. Um, is, is kind of how it works more uh, in those jurisdictions. It's designed so that the platform doesn't have to do detailed legal analysis, and therefore it can operate fairly smoothly and cheaply. However, AI infringement in this place in this place is not about legal clarity, at least not alone. It's about empirical. It's an empirical question. Content moderation on a platform like Hugging Face or GitHub or Civitai can become a research project each and every time. If you say, can this, can this model generate terrorist content? Can this model generate CSAM? Is it possible? Is it likely? You know, under what conditions? Well, this, these are questions that you actually have to ask with people who can do this kind of probing. There's no automatic tools. And the problems are so open-ended that it doesn't seem like any automated toolbox is going to give you uh, an easy way out of this challenge. So we propose that we do need to develop evidence packs for, um, for model flagging. Um, these are just implicit or explicit standards uh, for, for this area. So you have to think about um, uh, the, the, the the what kind of evidence would actually lead you to take this down. And it's a balancing test between evidence that the platform can look over and kind of verify without doing their own research, but not also being so big and detailed that the, um, uh, that the platform itself has to then verify like a huge document uh, and, and, and analyze it itself. So this balance is going to have to come out implicitly anyway, as this is figured out, and we argue it should come out more explicitly, and we have to do work on what this should look like. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, that's just sort of the next steps, um, and the paper is there. Apologies for uh, running over, but we have time for questions, and I believe we can also go over a bit if um, if if we need to to answer questions for those of you who are around, but please do put them in the chat. Please do put them in the question and answer thing. We'll go through them all, and we've seen some already. Thanks, everyone. Uh, wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to just pick out a couple of the questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, but a first one um, from Chris Quarles. Uh, do you think that moderation in AI is easier or harder to do effectively than traditional content moderation? Um, so yeah, any any discontinuities or continuities that pose unique challenges in this space compared to uh, content moderation in the social media context? Mm -hmm. I can just harder very quickly... Research. Yeah, go, go, Rob. Go, go. Exactly. No, that's what I was going to say. So I think that that kind of ties in nicely to Michael's last point, which yeah. is basically that, yeah, you need to, you know, this is not a context where you can imagine someone spending 10 minute, 10 seconds, you know, per model to review it as a, you know, a content, an outsourced contractor uh, in the social media moderation supply chain does um, for, you know, major companies like Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the one thing which, I also uh, just had as a kind of gut reaction when I was starting to wade into the space uh, with Michael last year was a concern also that just some of the easy wins and some of the lessons of basically the last 15 years of social media content moderation of platform governance haven't really been applied here yet. Uh, and maybe that's just because of resourcing or incentives and all these things we've discussed. But again, I think there's a lot more that companies could do, um, especially the major ones that have big valuations and are widely used. Um, so, you know, having staff that are actively kind of red teaming the platform and just looking out um, for, for stuff that is really problematic, doing this research, again, they could be doing it proactively, um, especially if the stakes for harm are high. Um, they could be doing some kind of, you know, trusted developer program or some kind of model review for unverified users. Again, there's there's many, many different things that they could be doing um, to kind of govern visibility, especially for, for new content. Um, and again, as far as we know, this is a fast moving space. Um, the people at Hugging Face especially, you know, seem really motivated. Um, so there's probably a lot of change that is happening, um, you know, every day. Uh, but I think there's there's clearly some some things that we could see um, in this space, at least from the actors that are really well motivated and want to tackle this problem. Great. And I, there was a question earlier in the chat about uh, liability in some of these cases. And I, I guess I would just add to that by 
I know in the paper you go in depth about the way that the DSA and the EU AI Act are pretty silent on the role that these model marketplaces and intermediaries play in this space. I'm just curious if um, anything related to the the proposed um, revised product liability directive would change that at all. I know you have a, in a footnote somewhere in the paper that products can still be considered user-generated content in online platforms in the EU, um, but curious about that additional sort of regulatory thing that may be coming down the road. And it also segues a little bit with a question from Jonathan Bellack um, about whether or not models should be viewed as a fundamentally different class of technology or content with distinct distribution rules, almost like armaments, um, and whether it, it's worth thinking about uh, models as, as a different subcategory um, within this regulatory space. Yeah, certainly. Um, there are, um, I believe in terms of products, we're thinking about not just product liability, but also the EU AI Act for this zone, because product liability is more about a tort harm when something happens rather than the hosting of a model, unless the hosting caused harm then you're probably not going to get a liability claim on that directly. Um, but you can get products taken down and platforms do get takedown requests from uh, product regulators and that's allowed um, within various legal regimes. The AI Act actually in, in the Digital Services Act in the EU into play in such a way that you don't get, um, I don't think you get AI Act related takedown requests. Um, I think that's, uh, that's actually foreclosed by the combination of those two regimes. Um, but they can be asked in order to be taken down by, uh, by, uh, by, by regulators themselves. So you do have some parts of the law where you think about liability of intermediaries around AI. But I guess what we're trying to say here is that this is about national law, uh, if it's about liability, uh, much more than it's about a sort of European law, if we look at Europe, um, and the whole hodgepodge of national law, which is exactly the bread and butter of content moderation having to deal with, well, does this model, you know, does this model regularly blaspheme the Thai king? Is of course like the kind of the kind of classic example in in Como. So uh, I think that's where we start to see this and the idea that platforms may have to get to grips with some of these regimes, um, particularly if we don't want platforms just to take down content arbitrarily. And and we don't really know how many of these regimes deal with these open ended models. So in other work uh, with Noel Gauman, um, I've been illustrating how many jurisdictions. Uh, there are laws that forbid essay mills and contract cheating, um, including in US states, but they're some of them a bit narrowly scoped, um, uh, which actually kind of by accident likely prohibit generative AI services um, because they're so broadly framed without knowledge and intent requirements. So sort of paper that we have as a forthcoming, but as a preprint online now. Um, and that's just an example of laws that have these unintended effects that interact with these broad technologies. So the problem with this is that these are some really tricky legal questions, right, where laws exist and they look like they actually are quite overbroad or they cover things they were not envisaged to cover. But it's not a court deciding this. It's a platform. And so the platform the CEO. is faced with the, yeah, the CEO yes. of the platform. See, this is the CEO, you know. But the platform is then faced with not just a like a tricky problem, but like one of the problems where a court would be like, oh, this is a very hard thing and we may have to make a whole new interpretation of the law to deal with how we square this circle. Um, certainly not something that any of the platforms that we talked about are equipped to do or probably have the legitimacy to do. Hmm. Just can I do finger really quickly? I mean, that, that comment is really interesting. Um, you know, classic, I guess, defaming the monarchy question or um, other attempt by certain jurisdictions to enforce their national laws. Um, connecting to your slides earlier, Michael, which are touching on the open rail licenses, right? If, you know, how many of the major models, uh, including ones released by big research labs are being released under open rail by a platform like Hug and Face and open rail says that uh, a takedown is justified if it violates any national law, right? I mean, I'm just, I'm just interested to see how this is gonna play out in the coming years and if we'll see some cheeky jurisdictions trying to remove major models um, just to see if they can. And I think part of what we're, I guess, arguing for and saying here is that I don't think companies are really prepared for that um, and prepared to make those kinds of decisions in a robust way. Although bear in mind with this that legally, it's only if the license saw complains 
So if right. a mod foundation model developer says, you broke the terms of my license, or an agent of them says that, that there is a takedown right. obligation. But we're seeing Hugging Face and proposing a solution here, which is different. So you know, legally, we might have some different different challenges there. But that's, that's the sort of interesting tension, which is more just saying their path through this is a very weird and messy one that we think is not going to go anywhere. Um, and is mostly going to be theatrical more than anything. But certainly, we do see that already in normal terms of service, right, where they say if you're breaching any law, you know, that, that, that's, you shouldn't publish content that's breaching any law on our platform. It's a common thing. Don't put illegal content on our platform. It's a common wording. And we do see also legal regimes like the Digital Services Act that say you have to enforce your terms and conditions proportionately. So we actually do see legal obligations to follow these terms of service through, uh, and those do apply to model marketplaces. Amazing. Um, and we, we have a, a, another question coming in, which I, I think is especially timely in light of the uh, net choice or arguments that happened last week in the United States. I know you guys were sort of setting aside the American legal context here. Um, but the question is about the seeming broad societal consensus that certain kinds of social media content moderation or, or the, the, the consensus that that was necessary, which seems to now be fracturing. Um, how do you see this? How do you see reversing this trend for model marketplaces, especially when the economic incentives point in different directions? And I guess that question just also highlights the the danger that a sort of common carriage theory uh, would pose for model marketplaces where they couldn't take down the chat 4chan or the the, the chat GPT 4chan or whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, but curious for your thoughts about about that question. It's probably a rub question to start with, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I've I've got a couple of thoughts. I think it's and and it's interesting that you linked it to the net choice cases and what's going on in the U.S. I think I mean I have two immediate reactions. So one is that you know a lot of the time when I was writing and researching this with Michael. I kind of felt like um, we we're back in like 2008 or 2009 in platform governance land in that, you know, it's still very small scale. It's happening organically. You have the literal, you know, you have high level companies, even CEOs um, jumping in and making moderation decisions. And they haven't really staffed up uh, infrastructurally, bureaucratically in terms of kind of policy development. Um, to actually deal with this yet. So I think in one hand, um, it's kind of interesting connecting to that question, like maybe this is just kind of the, this is before the backlash um, and we will maybe see an increase in resourcing in this area. Uh, and then again, maybe, you know, once that gets politicized and there's pushback, um, things could change. That's like one kind of reaction. But I guess the second reaction, um, you know, is more basically that, um, Oh, and now I've actually lost my train of thought. So I don't know if you have you have something to jump in there, Michael. And maybe I'll come back to it. It's late um, here and I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say that this is interesting because you know, I'm not sure that the trust and safety world then maps super well onto the AI intermediaries world, at least the way it's, it's sort of been constructed. And of course, it looks the same, but it's a bit different. And the logics then are kind of different because we're still wondering where in this supply chain you intervene, where in social media, it's pretty obvious. We don't really think it's a good idea to intervene at the DNS level or like the ISP level. And we don't really think it's a great idea to intervene at like client side scanning level and like have everything done on the device. And so in general, like it's pretty clear who does this, although there's community moderation and sort of the actors within that space. But for the AI space, we're like really not sure. Do you just stop these things being created? Do you stop them being deployed by users who are like really at the very, very end? Or do you put some like intervention in the middle to stop them being distributed? Um, and uh, you know, the actors like Hugging Face that are saying, hey, please pick us, pick us. It would be a nice idea that we would we would moderate for this. That's um that's a bit a bit tricky, I'd say. Um, I'd also spend this moment Sorry. to go back in the chat just to the questions about Lumen and to yeah. just to indicate that, that, yeah, Lumen will be a great thing to have this uploaded to. But interestingly, GitHub and Hugging Face, both without being asked, have or already created the, um, repositories of all of their takedown requests and published them that almost no one ever looks at. We, were, we couldn't find anyone who looked at these things other than us you know, in any scholarship. Um, and Hugging so, Face redacts. Uh, Hugging Face redacts some of it, yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, but that is the best practice for due process yeah. and transparency. I just yeah. I just picked up my thread. Sorry, um, cool. long we'll day. Thread away. What I what I basically was gonna was gonna add, which I think makes this particularly interesting, maybe for the U.S. context. Um, and I I hate to do it, but um, to plug the the book that I've been working on for the last five or six years, which is really I guess about the political drivers and mechanisms driving. Um, 
government efforts to shape how companies do content moderation. So the politics of platform regulation. If we think a little bit about that in this context, what I think is interesting is that actually a lot of the cutting edge issues here, especially for some of the potential bad actors that we mentioned, um, might actually not be as problematic from like a regulatory demand perspective in the US context. And I think part of that is because these are issues where, you know, I mean, the hate speech generating chatbot is one thing, um, but, you know, revenge porn, uh, child abuse imagery, these are things where even in the US, we see bipartisan support. And, you know, that's that's in that little Venn diagram where you could imagine congressional action, for example, happening. And, you know, so I wouldn't just point to net, net choice. I'd point to uh, COSA and, and other kind of related bills around child safety. So I think on one hand, obviously, you know, the tech clash ebbs and flows and there has been um, a wave of investment from companies, which also now has subsided in certain uh, instances where some companies think that actually, you know, regulatory compliance or, or um, I guess, good faith efforts to do trust and safety aren't really worth it anymore. Um, but I think, you know, still, um, yeah, I guess like in, in the medium term, it's feasible to imagine more government pressure, especially on the informal side not just from civil society groups that are really motivated in spaces like child safety, but also, you know, um, government actors that want model marketplaces to take this stuff more seriously. Because I think there's a real history, especially in the US, but also in the EU and other places of this kind of informal regulation being a major way through which uh, platforms basically change their policies and practices over time. Right. And I guess if we could squeeze in uh, one last question from the chat, I know it's uh, late across the pond and I appreciate you guys sticking with us. Um, but the question um, concerns examples of community governed marketplaces yeah, and federated sorry. marketplaces um, and how you see AI governance uh, or how do you see uh, it, it taking shape and looking like in these spaces? I know you make the distinction in the paper between uh, commercial um, and community sort of um, content moderation policies and that and that sort of binary. So curious for your thoughts here. Yeah, so there's two, two a few things that go on. So we don't we don't see any examples of what you would say at community governed federated marketplaces yet. We see we mentioned Shoggoth systems. We see kind of federated marketplaces as being a response to content moderation to say we need to develop stuff with no moderation whatsoever. We do see and we outlined the paper. We didn't give it much time in the talk, we see community governance a bit stronger in mm -hmm. software regulation. And we particularly see that on GitHub and Hugging Face, where, uh, well, to some extent on Civitai, given that the, 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 the people who run it, uh, the customers are telling them to maybe have a DMCA process. But the um, uh, the the uh, on GitHub, we, we look at times when um, uh, where software for security researchers it causes controversy, in particular, toolkits for pen testing, uh, where GitHub actually took down or prevented a toolkit that had Microsoft exploits in, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where uh, just after they'd been bought by Microsoft and people found that quite controversial. And then um, there was a backlash and they GitHub sort of felt like they had to put multiple versions of this policy out to the community. And they did actually edit them in response to this. And they had a, you know, a version that was quite different at the end. Um, hugging face, I think, also by relying heavily on the community talk pages to have like open discussions about content moderation. We see this is a new thing, um, not wholly new, obviously, in the whole internet, but it's a new thing for a kind of commodity platform, I think, to have that kind of open thread discussion that's kind of outside in, or inside out rather, you know, um, uh, at the moment at least. So I think we see that. Um, we may go and see more federated governance but in practice we're not talking about speech and like hugely different standards here the difference is that you know the, the problem with the tool is that that speech you can just close your ears to and say hey you know in our federated zone we talk like this in your federated zone we talk like this um and the harm is like pretty localized you'd say of course there's lots of complexity on top of that but a tool is like i'm selling a gun over here and like i'm not selling a gun over here but you can just download the gun here and then move and shoot the person over there like it's very different than than a normal expression based different standards so we don't you know th that's why the laws that we talk about are much more extreme about you know generation of csam generation of terrorist content and instructions and so on and so if you do have federated marketplaces 
the small ones are going to get hit by a legal hammer that's the size of the moon. And that's not exactly the same if you say, actually, federation helps us um, balance different expression standards without having to have a homogenous one size fits all thing. It's like, well, you maybe do need that if someone is selling like malware LLMs over here that are affecting the entire world. That's different than a than a traditional speech harm, at least at least in Europe, where we don't see everything as speech. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's just a question of, I guess, the ability of certain types of communities to effectively govern in the in the public interest, unfortunately, right? And already we did mention it here, um, but someone brought it up in the chat that a lot of these uh, communities, especially in the image generation space have a lot of community features. So they're maybe not fully community governed. They're still doing quote unquote commercial content moderation or rather um, you know, community oriented moderation where all the mods are hugging faces uh, staff or civitize small staff. Um, but they're actually trying to exploit the community uh, for monetization purposes, right? Um, so Civitai really uh, relies on donations and is active in trying to grow its user base. Its whole kind of value add is being easier to use, um, easier to interact with models, easier to see what models look like than something like Hugnify. So uh, a lot of models are multi-homed and are posted on multiple platforms. And you know we see in the talk pages on Civitai that people are talking about um, uh, talking about this and where they keep their different stuff as like almost insurance strategy in case stuff is getting moderated. Um, but the, the feature um, that they have uh, rolled out to much journalistic fanfare from our friends at 404 Media is uh, something that they call bounties. And that's their first attempt to monetize uh, some of the community on their platform where basically um, they've developed an auction system where any user can request a model mm. that produces certain types of content. So for example, a model that um, is tuned to create the likeness of X celebrity um, or, you know, and, and, or, or, or of a uh, create like art that kind of looks like a certain photographer or a curtain, a curtain, uh, a painter that you like. And again, um, their policies explicitly say that this cannot be a porn model. Um, that is impersonating someone. And again, how fast are they actually in terms of, um, you know, acting on these types of uh, models when they post? That's something that would be interesting to research empirically. But again, because of the features we mentioned, it's very trivial to take the impersonating Michael Veal model and combine it with a porn model, um, either on Civitai potentially or off platform. And the thing that the journalists at 404 uh, found, which I found slightly freaky, um, is that, you know, it's not just big ticket artists and celebrities that are being targeted through these bounties. And, and sorry, I didn't fully explain, but the idea is that you have an auction, multiple people submit impersonating models, and then the person that created the bounty um, gets to decide which one is their favorite. And then there's some kind of financial compensation to the winner of this contest. Um, and we're also seeing this being used for micro celebrities, Twitch streamers, influencers, and frequently um, 404 found like some apparent randos. So people are just posting, here's an IG handle. Can you script the public photos of my ex or something of some random person? Uh, again, this stuff is very gendered um, and say, hey, um, you know, create me an impersonation model. So again, um, that I guess is this tricky question of like, to what extent do community valences actually help you govern more responsibly? Amazing. Well, uh, hope everyone can join me in thanking Michael and, and Rob. Uh, we, we've seen the the sun go down behind each of your uh, office windows. So really <laughs> appreciate you joining us at what I know is a bit more of an inconvenient time than those of us based here in the US. But um, yeah, thank you again. Um, looking forward to seeing how this really exciting uh, research area develops and all your your subsequent work. But um, yeah, appreciate the talk and and the, the generous contributions from the folks in the chat as well. And we hope to see you in two weeks for an event with Dave Wilner on moderating AI and moderating with AI. So looking at how large multi multimodal models and large language models can help solve some intractable problems in more traditional content moderation. So um, a nice sort of follow up to this event. And we hope to see you guys there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot for having Thanks us. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us.